Welcome back. All right, moving right on, we looked at again uh, a little bit more developed uh, basic painting techniques. Let's now have a look at something that I'm working on here, which is um, uh, it's an it's a it's a way to to see if you can use the surfacer. It's not actually it's a kind of a, a very light haze gray um, but as a primer you're actually better in some ways using a light gray primer than you would be using a white primer unless you're painting white so, uh, so what we have here is a gloss black to do the edges and to sort of kind of um, you can see it's pretty messy it's my first time ever trying um, uh, I, I, I'm actually quite uh, pleased with the result. Um, what it does is it kind of brings out the edges a little bit more because if you imagine uh, a darker color like red or even a metallic color like silver uh, overlaid on top of a um, something that has an edge that's black and then that goes white, you're going to see that change and it's going to give you a nice shading effect. So uh, so that's one of the things you can do with this technique. Usually you do this with an airbrush and um, apparently I'm receiving an airbrush, a Skyward airbrush from uh, from Udisco. So that was the little surprise I was sitting on. Um, I'm going to be uh, picking it up as um, I have the time. I'm not exactly sure when, hopefully by the end of the weekend, but we'll see what happens. So here we go. As you can see, this one came out a little Sir, um, you can actually tell that the uh, the part is a 3D part. The angles and the edges and all these little um, grooves and everything are coming out um, quite well. You can't really see all those when it's all painted uh, or primed, I should say, in one uniform color like like the gray. It doesn't it doesn't quite have the same impact. So we're going to put those parts aside, and now let's have a look at uh, some of these. Um, uh, thruster of fuel tanks. So these are the thrusters. Um, there are, I believe, uh, how many of these are there? There would be four. Uh, there's 30. So, right? Is that right? Four, 12? That's not right. There's 24. <laughs> it's 12 times 2. Okay. So basically, what this is, is it's the actual tank. The tank, as you can see, has, um, it has a color because uh, bad die but um, you want to bring it up to a gray you can tell that it's not quite that gray yet it's not I'd, I'd maybe go over it with another layer of primer um, and that's so that you get a good coverage of primer and uh, also yeah, as you can see little imperfections like this show up you can tell that here's been a seam line that's been filled in right been uh, reattached I should say with um, so there's a technique to filling in seam lines that we'll, we'll cover at some point but uh, it, it certainly is something that can be done um, without too much difficulty. You can't really see it on the camera. <laughs> I'm trying to show you something that doesn't actually show up on camera. Um, but anyway we, we don't actually have HD cameras or anything yet. So you will be able to see that in, in person. So basically with these parts that have joined together joined together uh, like and so with the line usually you can see a seam there um, I have a better example that I'm going to show you in the next video but, um, what happens is that when you fill in the seam line it sort of looks like one universal piece you kind of take your time and really get the seam line removal right then you can make that disappear completely so that's something that works a little bit better once you this one's a little bit better at this point it was the fourth time around and um, it becomes harder and harder that seam line you can you can't feel it, but you can see the seam line again priming really reveals what is happening on the surface some of that you can't really see um, you can't really see if you haven't primed uh, your kit here we can we can see that again it's 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 a, it's a lot smoother right and um, but I think uh, is uh, is that I'm going to uh, give it another coat of primer as a nice uh, overall effect okay and let's go and have a look at the last piece that I'm going to show you in this um, in this little video 
dust there. Just a touch, not, not so bad. Hmm. I might dust this off with some candor a little bit later. But uh, Okay, it's uh, it's being modified, of course, and uh, and what's happening here is that it's been uh, primed using a rougher texture. I felt kind of brings out the a little bit more. So automotive primer, yeah, and so the automotive primer gives it that rough. Um, wow, this is a really sticky piece, eh? I'll flip it around so it bug me so much. All right, here we go. So so what you what you've got. Is it has this rougher kind of texture, which I, which I think will look quite good when it's painted in metallic colors. And, um, and uh, you just have to kind of... I'll ...wrap it up. Maybe I can go a couple of more seconds. Let me reach it. And, um, that I did a seam line removal and then a multi-layering of um, primer and paint. So let's have a look at that without destroying my workspace with this coiled wire. So <laughs> let's see what we can do. Okay, I've got that. You know what? I'm going to show you this while I'm at it too. And I can talk about masking for a little bit. And the importance of using good quality masking uh, tape, uh, hobby masking so here we go. Let's have a quick look and see at this Saku shoulder. All right, here we go. This is a, a shoulder piece. It's a it's a piece that goes onto the the shoulder of uh, the Zaku. The Zaku is a stormtrooper type character that sort of appears the you know dispensable um, you know villain mobile suit. So uh, they they show up in just about every Gundam. Suit. As you can see here, it is totally. totally deleted you cannot there's no seam line there done. and so that's been done over several um, uh, sort of iterations and you can tell that the priming is kind of shit, right there's a thing going on hmm it was primed black underneath and on top it's primed gray how did that happen so the way that that's done is that you lay down a base coat of primer that can be uh, any color doesn't matter and then you paint on top of that a gloss black you let that dry get the gloss black to be pretty much opaque okay and then on top of that what you want to do is you want to spray on some uh, primer in the sort of angles that you would expect the light to be uh, striking the piece from so that is to say that if uh, your light source is here for example then you'd have the light source kind of coming down then you'd have another light source here similar to how it would be displayed in your display case and so the offset of the white or light gray on the black um, brings out that shading in the color that you're going to paint it over afterwards. Now I had watched a sort of 10 part video from one of my fellow model builders in the UK and I noticed that the um, the intensity of the gradation between black and white was a little bit more than I was going for. I wanted a little bit more subtle effect so I'm going to try this with gray but this is to show you sort of the before picture what the part looks like when it's pre-shaded and then by painting it over afterwards. So that's that technique um, uh, at its um, you know stage one of two stage one of course would be painting it over afterwards. So the same sort of technique has been used here. Uh, here also you can see masking. Uh, in effect, guys, I know no one really likes masking, like taping off areas you don't want paint to get onto, but it's a fact of life. If you're painting model kits, um, masking is just a fact of life. If you want to have a nice clean effect, uh, you, you, you want to mask your, your parts. And so that's what I've done here. Uh, this base is, uh, I believe, in, um, in leaf gold or something like that. And then these uh, sort of uh, joints here are, um, okay, so they've been primed. They've been primed using uh, the uh, 1000 uh, surface uh, surface run prime, I believe. And then it's been painted using gloss black. All right. And uh, so you can 
there's some imperfections, but it's actually the overall result is quite decent. Um, there we go. So now what's likely going to happen, I've also sanded this down in between quotes. It's, um, I wish it was easier to show you the, uh, the imperfections, but maybe I'm learning It's it's fun to uh, to learn techniques of how to sand properly. For example, hey, maybe something. Like so let's see if this is picking it up. I've got a I've got a nice little drip here. Now, a drip is a very very common um, imperfection that a lot of people uh, feel kind of upset about when they see it. Can you see it on that one? No, right? it's too perfect. All right, hang on. <laughs> um, well, you can tell that there's no seam line there anymore. You can sort of see a seam line. Okay, so there you go. So you see that little bump there that was there? Um, there's a way to remove that bump. So it's a drip. It's, um, there was a little bit more paint that ended up on that little spot than elsewhere. So we're going to go ahead and we're going to go gentle to slightly more um, slightly more aggressive. So I'm going to start off with this 2,000 gray paper here. Painting, uh, when you're sanding paint, you want to be very careful so as you don't put too much pressure on it. All right. Now you might be wondering why am I not using a sanding block? Well, sometimes I do use a sanding block. Sometimes I just use my finger. Gentle strokes in one direction. You don't want to put too much pressure on it. The actual sandpaper is going to have more than enough uh, sort of gripping power to, um, to use the force of friction and actually remove it, cut it down layer by layer without going too hard. You can see we're bringing the high points down. It's, it's smooth to touch. If you want to really know, the, uh, it's a good idea to sort of take your time with it and get the effect that you're looking for. All right. Oh yeah, now it's uh, getting smoothed out more and more. All right, there we go. Now it's quite smooth to the touch. So without going uh, too far, it's a good idea to paint over it, uh, to let it dry, and then see if you're happy with the result. And really take take it down uh, one uh, sort of layer at a time without uh, without pushing too hard. But what's cool is that the seam lines have been removed. You might be wondering why would I um, assemble this and then paint it rather than paint it before assembling it together. Well, that's because there's there would have been three seam lines here that I decided to remove. Um, I hadn't planned on doing seam line removal. When I started building gunpla, but I just found that when I was looking at the kits that the Majins had built, uh, those are the uh, gunpla master builders who have been building, uh, you know, their life. Uh, the result that they get with uh, seam seam line removal um, really has a lot of character. To them. They look really good, and and I appreciated that, and it, it kind of out um, a little bit more of the art form of model model, model building uh, so you know so that's quite nice and uh, okay so let's move right on this is a piece that has been uh, masked to kingdom come and <laughs> you can see what what masking is required of these pieces there are no less than six parts like this and um, you have got to actually cut the masking tape to size to fit all these little parts that you don't want to paint in order to uh, have a leg, for example, as a leg part that is two contrasting colors. It's a lot, right? Um, so that's it. You know, you, you kind of hang out and listen to some music and, and do this stuff while you're while you're um, you know enjoying yourself. So that's certainly something that uh, that you can do. Um, there's a little bit evenness here on this part you can see there's a little bit of the under uh, coating or um, or the white primer in this case Krylon was used to give a little bit more of that rough um, uh, look but it seems that this uh, acrylic paint is acrylic paint is killing me it's, it's self leveling out all the roughness so if there's still some there so it's a little bit more rough than you would use 1000 or even 2000 uh, primer which gives it this perfect beautiful uh, finish which is nice for parts where you want that that kind of a look so um, 
was there anything else that I wanted to uh, point out this uh, this uh, this episode? Let's see. Um, there might be. There might be another. Show you guys. Let me think for a moment. Was there anything that I wanted to add? I always do this. I'll be through a video, and there'll be a wonder if there was anything I wanted to add. Oh yeah, it's panel lining. Panel lining is is one of my favorite things. About building models. It's really nice to bring out that. Panel. And uh, you can see that in the hands. Now the hands are some of the most uh, difficult things um, to paint if you're an artist. But uh, when you're painting, uh, you know, gun it's um, they're already more place for you so uh, you can still kind of um, you know give them a nice uh, sort of job and um, and enjoy that uh, in that form so here I'm gonna loosely pop one of these on I'm not gonna put much pressure just enough to have it uh, sit on top and sort of get an idea of what this might uh, what this might look like. so what I wanted to do is I want to have a contrasting a little bit different it's not something you see too often top of the the hand being like a, uh, an armored part, a protector, which is uh, in a dark color, the color of some kind of armor. And then the hand uh, fingers being uh, a little bit more nimble looking, so being the uh, color that the, the most of the Zaku uh, is in. Um, and it's this nice green here, Zaku green. And so you can see that wherever the joints are, on over it with some kind of a um, something that looks like maybe it was a black marker or something like that. So what is this panel lining uh, product? How do you get uh, your panel lines to stand out in a model? Okay, there's ways of doing this. Again, I like to stick to the that were developed for uh, specifically for model, model building uh, purposes. And what I like to use is uh, panel line accent by Tamiya. Very very long time because of the volume that you get. Now this is uh, 40 mils, so four, 40 mils of panel line accent will will get you uh, a lot of kits panel line. So, uh, one thing to note, is, uh, which is that if you say Gundam, marker, okay, a Gundam. Um, a panel line marker. Mine is um, somewhere in the building part. Doesn't really what it is is it's a marker. It's a felt tip or fine tip. It's very similar to the uh, Sakura Micron mic markers that you might be used to. Uh, ever tried to um, draw in a manga? I know where my Sakura Microns are. Here. Oh wait, there's marker. Well, here we go. All right, so I can show you. Yeah. So this is what I was talking about. This is a Sakura uh, graphic one. Um, this is not the micro. The micro would be this one. And uh, so you have this kind of a metal tip here, which you would be uh, using when um, you're drawing on vellum or any other kind of paper medium. Um, if you're into the graphic arts, that might be something that you enjoy. Um, so GSI Crayon makes also a uh, Gundam marker. This is used for um, making uh, panel lines. Now it's uh, 200. They may have more than one type of grade for this type of marker. You can see that it's pretty much uh, developed for uh, making lines on Micron. It's not quite the same. diary, you're going to get a much more even, uh, nice, right here. Um, I use these only for weathering. Um, it's really actually uh, a boon for weathering person because you're not necessarily going to have the same weathering on a Gundam as you will on a little tank, for example, especially in the case of my uh, Zaku, uh, specifically because the Zaku
going to get rust, you know, rain weathering, all that nonsense in space. You won't. It doesn't rain in space. <laughs> or does it? Uh, so what you will get, though, is you'll get space to be, um, you might have, like, some dust particles there. You can see, like, you know, something you would see on a dusty con, perhaps, or, um, you know, you, you would use a slightly different uh, weather. But you, you could see maybe, like, some some, uh, some oil marks or something uh, if the uh, uh, if the hydraulics are kind of I don't know venting or leaking or whatever. Have fun. Go with the look that you want. Uh, maybe you're going to have some residue from the the rock exhaust. Uh, that would be something that you would see um, near the thrusters, for example. And so I've uh, I have used a real touch marker a little. For that, um, and I, I found it to be decent. I wouldn't put an entire kit with that, though. Personally, it's not really a tool that I use very for uh, the purposes of um, of weathering. I it to be quite useful. So, getting back to the, topic to the panel, so you can use an line axis holder. It, it's just a Tamiya product. Tamiya products are widely distributed. In most countries, uh, I recently found out through the uh, Defense Lab forum that Tamiya products might be difficult to come by in Pakistan. So, if that is the case, let me know. I'm from Pakistan, as you probably know. But they are available quite quite widely in Canada and in, in Montreal, I would imagine in Toronto. But uh, so, you know, if you do need to, to, to have some, uh, some contact information of somebody, uh, here that might be able to, uh, uh, you know, send you, something, have you, uh, you know, give me a shout out. I can you know, get in touch with. So uh, having said that, there's to do the whole panel. Line accent uh, color. Uh, Tommy, I, I would imagine got the. else that's interesting that I'll show you a little bit later. This is so maybe I can give you an example this way. And I've almost found it. I think what's in here? Flat green. Green clear. Green clear. Thing, but I think one. Okay. Basically, what you want to do, uh, making your own panel and axe of color, okay, is that what you're going to do is you're going to take some uh, base. Now, here's what's interesting you can actually choose the color that your panel lines are going to be. So, if you want a black panel, keep in mind that when you time your panel and axe and color, you can kind of tell when you check the uh, the color of the, um, yeah, the, the the accent uh, directly, you're going to get smoky dark gray, which is the nature of the panel line accent. And it's exactly that color. If you like that small dark gray panel line, you do see it stands up beautifully on light greens. All right, you can also see that it, it does leave some traces. Maybe that's difficult to see there, but it does leave some, some traces that you can clean up um, afterwards. But it's a matte effect. Actually, gonna take off what I still can. Um, it's getting all scratched up before I've top coated it. In fact, I shouldn't really be manipulating it with my hands at this point, but just for the sake of checking it out, guys, um, I've done that. So basically, what happens is that if you take a base color okay, and you want a glossy effect, right? You want a glossy panel line, you like the smoke or the panel line look, right? You want a nice sharp black. You can do that. One is a gloss black, X1. Thin it down with a plenty of thinner. And then what happens is uh, you paint it on, you'll see that it's a pure black 
line. Really cool. The only thing you have to watch out for is this. Okay, this is designed for use um, uh, by by model builders of all skill levels. What you're doing here is you're doing a custom, um, you know, your own thing. So you then need to know how it works. You need to test it. You need to play around with it a little bit. You have the patience to do that. So much. Better. Uh, one of the things that is a rule of thumb when you're doing panel lining, I don't always follow that rule. I line that right on the plastic. That works too. If you've painted the surface, you don't want to line it on a painted surface. Why? There's a reason for that. It's because the paint that you have, okay, you have, and the paint that's going down. Start uh, reacting to paint and making it wet again, and then leaking out its color in paint that's in underneath it. You don't want that. What you do is you top coat it using a top coat here. All right, some uh, Mr. Bobby, um, Mr. Super. This is matte coat, and uh, so have glossy coat. I have glossy here as well. I was experimenting with a duplicolor uh, wheel gloss, which is something that is very, very uh, right on uh, uh, top coat used for uh, you know, alloy wheels on cars, but you can certainly use it on your models. Also, if you expect it to be played with and stuff, it's very durable uh, material. But having said that, it creates an inert barrier Okay, between the styrene, uh, the painted surface on top of the styrene and your panel line that's going to go as a fine. So, contrary to um, you might expect, is top coat is not quite on the top. If common practice. All right, so I think I covered uh, pretty much the basics here. There's other little items that you might be what I, what I use them for. So um, maybe I'll I'll cover those a little bit. Without spending too much time. On. Just some basic tools. Exceptionally sharp. This is the kind of blade that I normally use with that knife. They're a large size blade. Uh, and some smaller ones as well. And, uh, as you can see, they come pre oiled so that they, uh, they don't uh, gather or that they, they don't rust. That's uh, got some hobby blades here for you. Uh, these are actually really inexpensive. You can get um, online, on you get to buy hobby blades on because uh, very happen to live close to the dollar store and, and have them, so you know, sometimes I look for the but then if I find something, we get up and uh, that'll be that. So, uh, we have uh, here is the exacto. It's pretty much a typical exacto uh, handle. Uh, ah, you can see that the blade needs to be replaced. It's got some rust on it. Okay, so we're going to replace this blade, right? And uh, you may want to be a little careful when you do this because what can sometimes happen is you can cut yourself. Now you, you can see this is a typical thing that happens, right? You're trying to remove your exacto blade. The exacto blade is not coming. What do we do? Okay, what we do is we're going to use the Tool for the right job. You want a pair of pliers. My pliers are in my toolbox, so I'll go and get them. Right. I've got my uh, plug my headset back. 
cones. And let's have a look. I use my dad's. <laughs> Uh, okay, maybe a little trick a little bit here. Uh, the start piece are useful for certain when you're doing. Um, but, uh, for now, we're gonna we're gonna just look just uh, uh, to get that off without hurting it. So you want to actually put this into the plier and just twist it just a little bit, just like that. and that's it. That's it. You pull. It. You'll probably find those in your garage. Take this off. Another really nifty thing I really like that they sell at uh, the Dollarama is your little mini recycling bin. Okay. Pop it open. You've got your stuff that you're working on. Recyclable as you pop it there. You can it away uh, from your yeah, my a little bit cluttered now. You really shouldn't be cluttered. Um, avoid that. And so that is it. Now we just load in a new Zacto Blade. Thusly. All right, pull out a freshie. That one's relatively sharp, I believe. Um, people ask, why do Gunma builders get all the stuff at the dollar store? You don't. You can't buy everything at the dollar store, of course. But the stuff that you can, like you know, hobby blades and uh, Exacto and everything, um, it's a good place to do that. Uh, like I said the cost of Replacement of your tools should not be high, it should be low. So if you, if you need to replace a tool, you can do that at low cost. And um, ideally, that's close to home. And well, you're used to ordering robotic blades, but uh, you order enough of them because if you're in the middle of a project and it's a, you know, 11 p.m., chances are your local shops won't carry a specific, you know, brand or that specific type of tool that you're using. And when you're a beginner, you may not reap all the Benefits of using that tool um, level uh, of somebody with you know a few years of experience under their belt. So this is another type of hobby knife that I also use, which has got the uh, very same type of uh, Dollarama uh, blade on there, which is good actually. Right on with you. Uh, what else I have here? I've got my privateer press files. Okay, so these are uh, three different types. They're designed for styrene. Don't file with these. They're uh, quite delicate. You may uh, damage them if you try to do that. So the files um, sometimes get a little rusty. These ones are starting to show some signs of, um, of maybe uh, developing a little bit of, of rust. Um, not a huge deal, but if, if you take good care of your tools, then um, take care of you, I guess. So. Um, might uh, just uh, brush those down with a little bit of um, CLR or something like that to get rid of the rust. Maybe this toothbrush, and then that uh, sort of helps to um, you know get the rust, and then and then uh, uh, coat it with a little bit of, uh, of rust inhibitor. How you usually handle uh, rust removal. Uh, no, on me, but um, you don't really have to deal with that with plastic modeling. There. So that's the nice thing about uh, about plastic modeling, um, you you do want a, a little tweezer here. It's a, a part that came. Uh, um, it says here Jack Lee, AK T one fifteen. I don't know what that is, but it's something you get when you're, um, when you're doing those um, those uh, those electronic servers. On, uh, on eBay, uh, usually you order them from Hong Kong, from China. You can get, like some tweezers. With these, that's, uh, that's what I use for when I'm handling very fine parts. Um, like these, uh, here, sometimes you want to you want to be uh, a little bit extra careful when you're dealing with. Them. You'll be able to do that with a fine pair of tools, and uh, of course the spray cutter. So I've used Privateer. Um, this is actually a really good time to uh, to do a little quick review about these, and so let me on that. Shall I break the? I'm gonna show you guys tonight. Actually, is there anything else on my 
on my little uh, resource list. I don't think so. I think we're almost done. So let me um, get this in the city so that we can uh, so that we can carry on some other things. Yeah, right. I think there's nothing really else to cover in terms of the basic. If there is, I'll, I'll add it on uh, maybe on Sunday or something. So, um, so privateer press, the bad and the ugly. They're pretty cheap. I'll probably pick them up for around uh, 10 15 buck. It's not too bad as far as these uh, overpriced nippers go. These it's like a nipper bonanza out there. It's like making nippers. And people are freaking out about. That. Why are people obsessed with nippers? The reason why is because when you cut a off a sprue like this here, right? Um, what happens is that the, the sprue comes uh, up right at the gate, okay? And so that will leave a kind of a bumpy surface on the actual um, part that you're working on. And, and then what you have to do is you'd have to get rid of that using some of the files that I showed you earlier. Or uh, using your hot, using a fresh, brand new hobby blade and just razoring that right off. Be careful, get a nice clean finish. Working on um, all of the other kits that I have here from Thunderbolt Gun. Um, so, long story short, the better your nippers are, the less cleanup work you're have to do around those sprues and um, at some point I think you maybe you get to diminishing returns but it's not something I would check out on like I got these because they last me about a year probably after the, um, they're done is uh, you know American made product uh, are known because quality in price ratio is good. And, uh, obviously, if you want to go uh, for really high end product, you're going to pay more because a lot more, you know, uh, better quality materials went into it, better work went into it, and so a little bit more research and development. Or what you do. Um, and so now, uh, looking back, would I still go for a cheap pair of uh, sprue cutters for the first time? Yeah, of course. But uh, for my pair, um, I guess it depends on what the sponsors will want me to use. I mean, they probably have got some products on their own, maybe some Tamiya uh, ones or uh, some God Hands or something like that. But uh, certainly God Hands are on my radar, but frankly, I'm a little, um, I don't know, good. I've, I've used them before. Uh, but um, I'm curious about the Gun Planet ones because I've that Gun Planet has a pair of screw cutters which actually have uh, a one-sided slicing. You can see this one has two-sided. So whereas the Gun Planet ones and the God Hands, they're kind of a clone of the God Hand nippers, um, is that they only have one cutting side and the other side is flat, um, which has uh, benefits and its drawbacks depending on what it is that you're trying to cut. So, uh, so that kind of covers sort of the as a last extra bonus, we can um, discuss a little bit why you would why would you ever use Sharpie while building. So um, some see some piping, right? Zakus have piping, uh, especially Thunderbolt piping is like really nice and it looks quite realistic, right? So piping when it's all bent up, like on a, a sleeve, like when you have your sleeve of um, of your hoodie or your jacket, for example, has all these like uneven uh, sort of box in it, right? So those come out nicely, rub them down with a Sharpie, and then wipe it off right away with um, some whatever, some tissue of some kind, the TV, or uh, maybe you want to use some um, some paper towels. Or and, and so what that does is that the actual Sharpie has a, a more, um, it gives it more of a dirty, worn out kind of look that you might see on a mobile suit somewhere out in space or um, on some other um, on some other kind of surface then you would if you use Tom, uh, Tamiya panel line axe. Panel line axe will just kind of um, it, it doesn't it doesn't have the same kind of look to it. It just looks like you're trying to 
the the uh, the better rather than uh, you turning it up a little bit. So I'm going to be working on RGM 79 um, 1144 GM. Okay, it's a Thunderbolt GM. So I'm going to be demonstrating those techniques on the GM, and so you're going to be able to see exactly what I mean. And uh, on the Zaku one. So keep that in mind. Sharpies can be useful for modeling after all. And um, you know what? On that note, we're going to wrap things up. And I've been running on uh, quite long enough. And uh, once again, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. On that note, thanks for watching and stay frosty.